Pick your class and learn your battle points. Because it's time for the Star Wars Battlefront Podcast. Welcome to episode 167 of the Star Wars Battlefront Podcast. I'm your host, Sage Goodman, joined by my brother and co-host, Sam Goodman. Hello there. In this episode of the podcast, we'll be going over the newest community transmission on behind the scenes of the visual effects in Star Wars Battlefront 2. Let's get started. Incoming transmission. Explosions. Blasters. Smoke. Steam, fire, rain, lightning. Odds are that you've encountered these and many more of the visual effects, VFX for short, during your time playing Star Wars Battlefront 2. Today we take a look at how visual effects fit into the game, as well as the process behind some of them. Despite their ubiquitousness, there's quite the word there, it can be quite difficult to pinpoint exactly what visual effects are in a game. Senior VFX artist Anders Eglius reflects on this. Most people associate visual effects with sprites, i.e. flat planes with transparent textures, but modern game engines like Frostbite have become so flexible and powerful that we can now use our visual effects tools to create a lot of things that traditionally would have to be created by other parts of the game team, e.g. animation, lightning, technical art, even code. From birds and leaves on Naboo, to full scenes of background fighting with vehicles and hundreds of soldiers on Geonosis. A lot of people don't even think of these elements as effects. Point being, our job is anything but repetitive, and because we dabble in many different areas of the game, we get to collaborate with a lot of talented artists, designers, and coders too, which is super rewarding. One way of getting to grips with with what visual effects are in a game is to categorize them based on the role they play. Gameplay effects. This type of effects are there to communicate gameplay mechanics and give feedback to the player when you do something or when something happens. Examples are weapon impacts, muzzle flashes, blaster bolts, destruction elements, lightsabers, character slash vehicle abilities, and UI-like effects. These all have to work well in many different situations and lighting conditions. Since visual fidelity is such an important aspect of Star Wars, and by extension Battlefront 2, they also need to stay true to the source material look great, and feel Star Wars-y. Creating these types of effects often involves many iterations until all of the above requirements are satisfied. Environment effects. Most levels are embellished by different types of environment effects. Fog, fire, smoke, rain, snow, swirling leaves, and more all help the world come alive. But also give visual cues to help you understand your surroundings. Narrative effects. Cinematics and many battle beyond scenes often use the same type of effects as the other two categories. But the storytelling aspect is the most important part. And the setup is more similar to traditional keyframe animation in that effects are triggered by a timed sequence rather than resulting from triggered events. Capital Supremacy contains many cinematic and narrative elements. Needless to say, many effects fall into more than one. Even all three categories, like the dust storm on Geonosis or the fires in the scene below. There's a gameplay aspect in that they provide cover and straight reduction risk slash reward decisions, i.e. do I take a shortcut and take some damage or do I go around. They certainly enhance the environment, art, and they tell a story about a battle that has been raging before you got there. What all these types of effects also have in common is, of course, to help immerse the player into the world and support the artistic vision of the game. Visual Targets Before starting work on an effect, it's important to have a good reference of the desired end result. This helps identifying details that would otherwise be missed and facilitates communication with the art director, designers, and other stakeholders. This is Enders again. The Star Wars franchise is extremely gratifying because you almost always have access to good reference material and because the visual style is so distinct. There's of course a flip side to that. You're expected to nail the look of the movies with every effect. Other IPs might not come with the same baggage of what things look should look like, but I prefer that any day to an unclear vision. Most of the time it's easy to find the references we need, like in the case of the Droidica shield which appears in full glory at the start of episode 1. Other times we take help from our in-house Star Wars gurus like CJ and Guillaume to dig up just the right scene from this or that episode of The Clone Wars. The collaboration with Lucasfilm is also crucial to that result. They often suggest things we would never have thought of. They provide us with the needed reference material. They've even sent us raw footage from practical on-set explosions and other special effects, and we constantly rely on their expertise for for feedback and advice. 
Another source of reference is the work of our talented concept art team. The concept art establishes a clear vision and allows us to start thinking about potential challenges early on. We can look at a concept image and go, yeah, no, that's never going to fit into our performance budget. But then you go back and start thinking about the challenge and eventually you'll find a way to cram it all in there. So how are visual effects made in a game like Star Wars Battlefront 2? Unlike other artists who use programs like Photoshop and Maya to create their assets, the main tool of the visual effects team is the game engine itself. The most common part of an effect is the particle system or emitter. A particle is just a point in space with properties like size, rotation, color, and transparency. Unlike traditional keyframe animation, particles are then usually simulated, which, grossly oversimplified, could be described as the game engine applying basic physics to them as they evolve over time. The artist can then vary these physical properties, e.g. gravity, air, resistance, etc to get the desired result. The final effect is typically made of multiple emitters, lights, and other components. Often, many different effects are needed to make up a gameplay feature, environment, or cinematic event. Lighting effects. When it comes to making effects fit into the rest of the game world, there's probably nothing more important than their interactions with lighting. For this to work and be fast enough to calculate for all target platforms, the engine combines cheap per-vortex lighting with approximated textures based on volumetric lighting. A simplified forward scattering model is you also used to get nicely backlit particles. To give the right look to fire and other self-illuminating materials, a so-called black body calculation converts grayscale images into believable fire colors and intensities. New technology. In addition to the standard particles covered so far, Star Wars Battlefront 2 was the first Frostbite game to ship with a new GPU particle technology. We were thrilled when the Frostbite engineers approached us and asked us to collaborate in developing this new system. Andres recalled, happy to be your guinea pigs, we said. A lot of the effects in the game simply couldn't have been made without it. GPU particles are much cheaper than their old GPU counterparts, so you can have lots and lots of more fun with them. Also, they're programmable, so that allows for much more complexity and control. The downside of that, though, is that they're a lot harder to make because we have to build everything from scratch so we can only use them where the old system can't deliver what we need. Ergo, background crowds. Some other examples of effects created with the new GPU particle system are rain, snow, sparks, embers, pebbles, metal debris, leaves, insects, and whistles. Lightning and electricity, birds, blaster bolts, and of course, lightsaber blades. Constructing a new lightsaber. Lightsabers are specifically lightsaber blades, are some of the most iconic effects in the Star Wars universe. In Star Wars Battlefront, the shape and colors of a blade are procedural, which means that instead of using a texture to divide the blade, different math functions are combined in a so-called pixel shader, which gets called when the blade is drawn to the screen. This allows for visual tricks like making them look like they have a volume even though they're drawn on flat planes. Creating the blades for Star Wars Battlefront 2 wasn't without its problems, however, according to Anders, we used basically the same technique in both games, but it turned out to be a lot harder to get right in the sequel. One reason for this was simply time constraint. There were more lightsaber wine wielders in the second game. The first one had only Luke and Vader, and they were more diverse. We weren't 100% happy with the look, but it was it kind of worked, so we figured let's move on and build all the other effects needed for the game. Another reason was that the differences between light settings were much bigger in the sequel, making it more difficult to keep consistency across all lighting conditions. Finally, Stretch Bloom, which was introduced to mimic the look of The Force Awakens, became very exaggerated with the very bright objects. As a result, the intensities of the blade had to be toned down a lot since glow is applied equally to everything on screen based on the intensity of the pickles. The pickles. <laughs> based on the intensity of the pixels. Ironically, once we decided to remove Stretch Bloom in the past launch patch, the post-launch patch, excuse me, it paved the way for a look that was more true to the movies, Andres concluded. Uh, Anders. He said Andres there. Okay. I read it how it is, okay? okay. So if he misspells, I'm going to misspeak, Okay. Okay. <laughs> As hard as it was getting the shape, colors, and intensities of the blade right, the characteristic motion fan posed its own challenges. Traditionally, you would rely on the built-in motion blur of the game engine, which we tried during the early production of the first game. This proved problematic, however, as the blade would have to be a solid object like Phasma Staff, instead of the pulsing cylindrical volume we all know and love. Moreover, the frame rate in a game is much higher than in a film and can be even higher on powerful PCs. Therefore, the amount of motion blur would be much less than expected and didn't look right. The answer was to, con- the answer was to connect planes, which, much like an accordion, would stretch from the current position to a fixed time offset. 
An additional problem was that before the June update, the back rotation was stored in a world space. It's supposed to be Anders, right? I think so. Okay. I'm not sure, though, since it's spelled differently in the same article. Just going to do it like it's spelled. This would be Andres continued. So sometimes you get a lot more motion blur than you expect when rotating with your character. The blade didn't move at all in camera space, but rotated quite a lot in the world space. Now we store it in a camera space, which is closer to how the real camera motion blur works. Anders, okay, here's Anders now. Anders finished. It's a bit painful that it's taken so long. We tend to prioritize new content over polishing existing assets. But it's nice to be finally at a point, no pun intended, where we're happy with the lightsaber blades. We will, of course, continue to improve lightsabers and many other effects in future updates. Additional VFX artists who contributed to the image slash videos and who have helped make the VFX in Star Wars Battlefront 2 what it is today. Jonas Anderson, Tobias Algren, Nadab Goksu, Daniel Cobb, Gustav Hengerling, Stephen Huang, Keith Walters. We hope you enjoyed this behind-the-scenes look on VFX in Star Wars Battlefront 2. If you'd like us to explore further topics in this way, be sure to let us know in the comments below. This is a very a different type of community transmission. What are your thoughts on it? We've seen this sort of format in the past in Battlefront 2015. They did have a certain aspect on some of the, the props they use in the photo, photo, photo photogrammetry, I believe it's called. They, they had a, a whole GDC event on photogrammetry, and then they did some videos on it but then but they didn't really have any articles based specifically on it but they did it, it's cool to see more of the technical aspect of these games here because you don't really don't think about this kind of stuff and at least for me in a layman's perspective it doesn't make a lot of sense as it does to probably some of the more connoisseurs of game making but it's still nice to kind of get familiar with, with these type of phrases and how this all works i'm a, I'm a big fan of these types of articles i, I love the nitty-gritty of game making and how they they get past certain challenges i am a i also i th i think it's great for the community even like even just like as a layman being okay this is what these developers go through now i can kind of tamper my expectations on what i would like from the game yeah well well that's a good point so if you know how these things work and what kind of effort is put into it you won't have such an expectation that they really can't meet and you'll have a little more patience with the developers because it is a long and tiring process to you know pump out these updates and all this. And like you were saying, the the visual effects team is a huge part of why Battlefront Two looks so good. And I, I find it I find it very interesting how many different like little techniques that they do to basically break how they run the game to make it look good. And it's nice to see it between these two point of views. We have Anders and Andres. I know explaining this to us fascinating it's fascinating they must be like twins or something because their names are so similar <laughs> hell anyway i i do enjoy this kind of thing it's definitely different from what we normally see but we're in kind of a slowish part of battlefront we just got the droidic update and all that stuff and i'm not going to expect more content in the next you know few weeks and all this but this is nice to see at least something yeah we that, that they're alive and you know they're still doing this it was either um ben walker or kevin <laughs> went on to Twitter and they did announce that we will not be getting the content details for August until August, but they, they, they're working on the community transmissions. And, and August is really close right now, but we're, we're, it will be the beginning of August or more towards the middle or end. I I'm, would assume the beginning of August. Uh, that's what I hope for, but I would, exp I, I, I think it'll probably be like early mid August. This is good. The game is in a good spot. You know, I still enjoy playing the game. It's nice to see all this more technical stuff. I hope they do do it in the do do. I hope they do it in the future more. Yeah, yeah exactly. It'd be nice to see. This is more of the visual effects type of things, but we can see maybe some of their prop design and all that would be really cool to see. Yeah, but they have definitely a lot of options. This could be a whole series and doesn't have to be necessarily a community transmission. They could just do a little sub forum just dedicated to some of the technical aspects of Battlefront. Exactly. And I think that's what a lot of people, I think that's an issue that they're facing. It's like, oh, this is the community transmission. We have to have this one and we can't have any others. But I, I appreciate how they're going and being like, okay, we've got a community transmission that's based all around the creation of visual effects in Battlefront 2. We're going to release that and this will be our community transmission. And... 
during this lull of Battlefront where they were they're not releasing content, they're trying, taking a break and they were fixing stuff and just focusing on the community and making that more of a, a rest period for the game because the developers have been working extremely hard on it since launch and a lot of them are going and taking vacations right now what what future would you what future content like this would you like to see break it but broken down like i did say i would like to see the props that'd be cool maybe how they go about creating a skin would be nice to see that's that's what i would like to see and does give it a little more light it'll give them if it's really hard it'll give them an excuse you know i guess it's i don't know it's I just, yeah, basically I need to know more of the information before I start judging is basically what I'm trying to say. Yes. So I'd like to see what goes in the process, maybe even idea-wise of what they want to do and how that executes Yeah. within the engine itself. I would love to get into the nitty-gritties of how they create a skin. Like That would be fascinating. Maybe we could do something in the future if if this is something that uh, you, the listener, would love to see. We've done, I, I did a previous kind of mini documentary called on the battlefront which is the lead up and before the the release of battlefront 2 and the whole journey that took with a bunch of creators i had as a true i had battlefront updates elliot i had rivetims a whole bunch of people and we did a whole like scripted kind of thing like that that's something i would love to do and if it's something that you're interested in let us know because i would love to get into the nitty gritties on that. And uh, like you're saying, I would love to be able to be more knowledgeable of what to expect with a skin and know the background of it. Because skins right now is like, oh yeah, just just slap something on when my expectation, my assumption is that it makes it takes much more effort to do something like that. And it's so easy to get angry at certain developers when you don't know what goes into the process and I'm guilty of this, but mm-hmm. It's it's on them still. If because, you don't want to give us information, we're going to get mad at you. So yeah, because we don't we don't have the information to understand what's actually been going on. And I think that's something that the community definitely needs, especially the we we need that as we need that more in the gaming community because like with films, we get tons of behind the scenes we get tons of articles speculation and interviews with a bunch of the people and video like games with movies you understand that that takes a long time and video games is an art and it should be kind yeah. of reveled in that same aspect exactly and video games it's very like oh we have no idea what exactly went on we hear rumblings but oh yeah you can't talk about that so i would love to see more of this type of content especially going into how they make maps how they make heroes, how they make skins. Skins is definitely top of my list. I would love to see them go into deeper detail on from the creation of the idea to getting it approved to working with all of the different teams inside of DICE to get it into the game. And also just like what it takes to get the game updated. That whole process would be fascinating. I would also like to see a behind-the-scenes community transmission on community transmissions. Yeah, especially when they have a slow season, like people are, developers are off, taking a little vacation. This would be nice for, you know, the forum runners to mm-hmm. do this kind of thing. Be good, some, get some CTception in here. And maybe do this maybe once a month, once a week, you know, bi-weekly. That would be cool to see, to get a set schedule. And they did say at the end, if they... If we want them to see, you know, want to see more of the behind the scenes type thing that they can do that. So it's it's logical and possible to, to see this in the future. Which I would definitely love to see more of because it's something that I'm extremely interested in. I watch as many do- game de- development o- documentaries as I can find. I would love to create more of them. So definitely if that's something that you're interested in, uh, we can try to get a contact in. I could reach out to some of the contents, contacts that I have at DICE and try and get some interviews going through there and get something produced, which I would love to do. I think that would be fascinating and a good look and also be able to hear these developers' voices and hear their enthusiasm and hear them as people instead of just a profile image on Twitter or a name that's on the forum. I mean, they could do it in like a web webisode type thing or okay, they could do it online, but a bunch of be much easier and more cost effective to just do it through community transmission which is fine but it'd be cool to see maybe these once a week and then maybe a video type thing 
once a month that'd be really cool to see because hey, they've had they've done them in the past like they've been talked about battlefront 2 have had youtubers on i think they were doing a tour of dice and they had video of that mm-hmm. so they've done it in the past and that'd be cool to see uh, up. cinematic captures did the video on the creation with dennis brunval which was a very well done video but hey yay star wars dice if this is something that you'd like to get on the bandwagon with we would love to produce some uh, some interviews and documentaries for you. Definitely be fun. I think that's about it for this episode of the Star Wars Battlefront Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. You can follow us on Twitter at SWB Podcast, twitter.com slash SWB Podcast. If you'd like to support the show, you can support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash Battlefront Podcast. Shout out to our $10 a month patron, Joseph Loera. It's greatly appreciated helps us support the show and the hosting and upgrading the uh, equipment that we have another way that you can support us like daniel Schilling did thank you so much for the donation it really helps is through paypal paypal.me slash tie dye sheep t-y-e-d-y-e-s-h-e-e-p our gmail is battlefrontpodcast at gmail.com and our youtube channel is youtube.com slash the star wars battlefront podcast if you have topic ideas thoughts on what we've discussed thoughts that you've had through the podcast definitely let us know and hit us up on email or twitter you can listen to the show on itunes soundcloud stitcher google play or wherever you find podcasts as always thanks for listening and may the force be with you how you like that dark mode sunny jim let's get started shall we three two one